Hello, everybody, and welcome to Life with Impact Hub. Um, we are today uh, in the fifth edition um, talking about the resilient enterprise leading through uncertainty and complexity. So for everybody uh, who's new to our uh, Life with Impact Hub series, um, it's a series of online global events to inspire, to connect, and to enable a multi-location audience of entrepreneurs, of ventures, of organizations, and any kind of companies and individuals um, that are interested in strategic topics such as community building, impact creation, innovation, as well as, of course, the important topic of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic that we're in, um, we have made it our goal to make these events a bit more focused on subjects that matter right now. So um, we have started out with a series on uh, remote work, uh, well-being in times of isolation, um, how we can successfully manage our businesses in times of disruption. And in the last one, we had um, the CEO of uh, WWF Switzerland, Thomas Valacott, join us and talk a little bit about uh, climate action um, through and after the time of the pandemic. Now, this time, we are very thrilled to be joined by our partner, Ernst & Young, as we will be discussing um, yeah, the importance of enterprise resiliency and that in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak. So Ernst & Young will share key lessons on business continuity and the range of resources and services that they have um, that they made available to support impact entrepreneurs through COVID-19. So um, we will discuss a number of topics around um, supply chain resiliency and navigating your people through crisis. Um, and also some other topics that are relevant uh, when it comes to that. But I think there's no one better to uh, hand it over to and to tell us a little bit more about it than uh, Jesse Cortez. Hello and welcome. We are very thrilled to have you. Fantastic. Thanks, Flora. And hi, everybody. It's wonderful to connect with you all today. And I'd just like to thank Flora and the whole Impact Hub team for, for inviting EY to, to join this live with Impact Hub series. Um, as Flora shared, my name is Jessie Coates, and I lead EY's work globally to support impact entrepreneurs. And clearly, COVID-19 has brought uncertainty to every organization. But from the research available to date and indeed the conversations that, that I have had with the entrepreneurs in our global network, sadly, it, it does appear that it is hitting early and growth stage businesses particularly hard at a time when social innovation is needed most. And so we wanted to curate for you an agenda to cover hopefully some of the most critical topics on your mind, including how to build supply chain resiliency, how to navigate your people through crisis, how to maintain effective communication with your customers, and how to manage your cash flow. I'll start by sharing a very brief introduction to EY and how and why we're so proud to support impact entrepreneurs before passing over to my colleagues to share how we think about enterprise resilience in response to a crisis like COVID-19 holistically and to provide really practical tips and guidance around those four critical topics that I mentioned previously. And then we'll close by sharing some of the services and resources that EY provides on a not-for-profit basis to impact entrepreneurs globally. Um, so this session will last for about 90 minutes and will be recorded to enable you and your colleagues to watch on demand. And resources, including this presentation deck, are also available through the resources list um, on the console. I'd also highlight um, that while we aim to share leading practice insights, we really value interaction uh, from the audience. So there'll be plenty of opportunity for that as well. We'll be running interactive polls at various points in the webinar, and we'll also be running Q&A sessions. So please do post your questions via the platform as we go, and we'll aim to directly address as many of them as possible. So to take us through these critical topics, I'm joined by several of my EY colleagues from all over the world who have both deep experience of their respective competencies, working with many of the world's leading organizations, but who also have direct experience of working with early and growth stage impact-driven businesses to help them overcome barriers to growth. You've already met Flora, uh, Global Brand and Communications Director at Impact Hub, who opened the call, and you've met me, EY's Global Impact Entrepreneurship Leader. And you'll also meet uh, a few of my EY colleagues as well. So Kyle Newell is an Associate Director in our Global Corporate Responsibility Team with over 15 years of experience in the impact entrepreneurship sector, and he'll be facilitating the webinar today and the Q&As with the speakers. 
Anton de Klerk is an associate director in our supply chain and operations practice in Johannesburg, South Africa, and has worked across the world in more than 20 countries helping companies transform their end-to-end -end supply chains. He'll be sharing insights on how to build supply chain resilience in this challenging time. Renish Nair is a senior manager in our People Advisory Services practice based in Chicago in the US. Renish has over 15 years of experience in the areas of strategy, operating model, organizational design, performance management, change management, and HR transformation. And he'll be providing practical guidance on how to navigate your people through a crisis. Daniela Mandakaru is a senior manager in our customer practice based in Dubai in the United Arab Emirates. Daniela will be sharing insights from her 10 years of experience focusing on customer strategy, product development, and performance improvement principally across the financial sector. And finally, Andrew Hill is a manager in our strategy practice based in New York in the US. Andrew has eight years of experience in financial improvement, cost optimization, financial planning, IT financial effectiveness, and restructuring for clients in the energy, aerospace, and defense, retail, and healthcare industries. He'll be sharing practical tips around cash flow and financial management. So as an introduction to EY, we are a global leader in professional services, including assurance, tax, corporate finance, um, and advisory services, and our purpose is to build a better working world. We have 280,000 employees globally and offices in over 150 countries, and we serve the world's leading businesses, governments, and institutions to build trust and confidence in the capital markets and in economies. And EY Ripples brings together that global EY network in an effort to achieve one shared vision to positively impact the lives of one billion people by 2030. And our intent is to engage all of our people in not-for-profit activities to achieve that bold vision by focusing on the areas where EY can best leverage its core capabilities to create impact at scale. The EY Ripples program has three distinct focus areas where we believe our global knowledge, skills, and experience can make the biggest difference. The first is supporting the next generation workforce. The second is accelerating environmental sustainability. And the third is working with impact entrepreneurs, helping to scale small and growing businesses that are driving progress towards the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And with billions of people still excluded from access to decent work and opportunities and goods and services exacerbated by COVID-19, we truly believe at EY that you, as a very special breed of innovators that we call impact entrepreneurs, are at the heart of how we can achieve a better working world where everyone can contribute to and share in the benefits of sustainable, inclusive growth. And so to serve this vital group, EY teams around the world provide a range of services to bolster your scale and success in those critical early stages of growth, from webinars like this to digital tools, skills development and coaching programs, as well as long-term capacity building support. And with that introduction to our work, I will pass over to my colleague, Carl Newell, who will provide an overview of how we think about enterprise resilience in the context of a crisis like COVID-19. And we'll facilitate the session as we move through the agenda of different topics for today. Thanks, Jesse. As Jesse mentioned, we know that COVID-19 has brought uncertainty to every organization and in particular to small and growing businesses who are the backbone of our economies all over the world. When we start, started to consider how best to support businesses, we began by determining the needs of small businesses in relation to the pandemic. With conversations with enterprises across the world where the spread and containment of the pandemic and its effect on the economy differs, we identified these needs could be broadly considered across three time horizons, now, next, and beyond. Right now, many of our, of our enterprises we work with are trying to find ways to keep their businesses afloat, manage the day-to-day -day complexity of operating in a crisis, and just trying to do their best to survive. But for the next phase, enterprises operating, perhaps in economies or sectors which are now beginning to recover, we find that many of them are beginning to look to ignite recovery through adaptation and to strengthen their enterprise resilience. And finally, we are already uh, seeing a small number of very innovative, forward-thinking enterprises looking beyond the COVID-19 crisis and preparing for the new normal. 
seeking out ways in which they can deliver long-term value by reframing and transforming their businesses for the future. We know we can't control the forces of nature, but businesses can control how they respond. And so here at EY, we have developed an enterprise resilience framework to help you respond to COVID-19 across these three time horizons. The business framework identifies nine areas of, in, of an enterprise can address to assist businesses' continuity and build resilience. These include supply chain and global trade, employee health and well-being, talent and workforce, customer and brand, financial and investor, risk, government and public policy, technology and information security, insurance and legal disputes. Through the webinar today, we will address five of these nine areas. Before, however, before we jump, jump in, I wanted to gauge from the room to help our speakers understand uh, who's in the audience. So I have two interactive poll questions for you. Um, on your screen, you will see a, a set of questions asking, where in the world are you joining us? If you could please fill out that, the poll that's on your screen, we will be able to understand the best geographical, ge geographical uh, areas where you are coming from. And we'll give about 30 seconds or so for people to, to fill out uh, that questionnaire. Okay, to, to summarize, it looks like we have a, a really hefty audience coming from, from Europe with a number of um, people joining us from uh, the African continent, uh, the rest of North America, and throughout the rest of the globe. It's a, it's a pretty good geographical split, split that we have today um, in the audience. Secondly, to understand the stage of your businesses, how would you like to – how would you describe the maturity of your enterprise? Again, please – click on the checkbox of which best represents you, including your businesses in the conceptual blueprint phase of developing your business, the validation phase where you're testing your enterprise model, the preparation phase where you perhaps have established operations in one market and are considering expanding into another, or the scale phase where you are already rolling out the model across multiple markets or customer sets. And we'll give people another 15 to, to 20 seconds to, to fill out the, the interactive poll. It looks like we have a, a good mix between stages of businesses in the audience with people both in the, the blueprint, developing, developing the blueprint for, the, for, the, for their business, as well as uh, businesses that are in the scaling phase of their business where they're looking to develop and expand their, their business model across geographies. I'm now going to pass over to my colleague, Anton de Klerk, who will share his insights on building supply chain resiliency. Thanks, Kyle. <clears throat> good afternoon, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be with you here today. And uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, my name is Anthony Clark, and I sit in the uh, Johannesburg office of EY. Most of my career has been all around advising clients, big and small, on supply chain strategy, including cross-border trade, logistics, procurement, manufacturing, and also end-to-end -end supply and demand planning. As Jesse mentioned, I've worked on most continents, and I spent 10 years working in the London office before I returned to South Africa, where I grew up. It's great to be with you today, and uh, really looking forward to answering some, uh, some questions later. <clears throat> Just as many of the folk joining today, we've really felt the effects of COVID-19 uh, down here in South Africa. The curve is really only now starting to increase rapidly here. 
So even locally, we have lots to prepare for in South Africa and on our continent, Africa. You know, one area that we've seen here uh, across our continent and across the world most impacted by COVID-19 is, of course, the supply chain. We've seen factories shutting down. We've seen borders closing, airplanes grounded, ships not sailing. And at the end of the day, people have just not been getting their products on shelf. The impact has been vast. The World Trading Organization is predicting overall trade might fall by up to 30% globally this year. And that is significant. Our own economy in South Africa is being pushed into a significant recession. Unemployment is soaring. And what we need to do is to take a moment and to stand still and learn from this and apply that learning to the future. And hopefully that's what you'll take from today is to really just get some pointers and some guidance as to what we've seen and what we're suggesting companies can do now to really prepare for that. Every industry has been affected, some negatively and some positively. We've seen some massive declines in energy usage. We've seen a decrease in exports impacting manufacturing. The tourism industry has been struggling. But of course, there's been winners like some of the tech companies and the data providers. Also, some of the e-commerce platform providers as people have stayed home and really leveraged e-commerce. At EY, we see the supply chain and global trade piece, um, one of the nine areas that Kyle mentioned, a key part of the resilient enterprise. It, of course, connects very closely with the other areas, people, tax, risk, cash flow. Um, but I will specifically have a, have a quick deep dive into supply chain. So, Jesse, if you can um, please move on to the next slide. Fantastic. So, so just to first frame it up, supply chain disruption is not a new concept in any way. We've seen earthquakes, strikes, cyber attacks, fires, and change in trade regimes all impacting supply chains in one way or another. COVID-19, however, is unprecedented in its impact, and it's made very apparent the gaps in supply chain resiliency. If you look at the top right-hand side of this slide, our experience really has shown that traditional supply chains have almost done exactly the opposite of what is needed to be resilient. Pooling spend with as few suppliers as possible, decreasing inventories as much as possible to realize cash savings, and rationalizing and reducing their manufacturing footprints, cutting costs and cutting people. You know, really running an efficient and lean supply chain. If very efficient and lean supply chains don't necessarily lend themselves to be extremely resilient. And on top of all of this, crisis plans were developed and shelved where they gathered dust. And my view is that all businesses, large and small, service businesses, product businesses, and anything in between, must really fundamentally evolve the way they think about embedding resiliency into their supply chain design. We recommend a three-step approach, which talks about being prepared, sensing events or changes, and then triggering the right response. So let me take you through those three steps in a little bit more detail. And my hope is that you'll be able to apply that same thinking to whatever business that you're running. Being prepared means that you've understood the potential risk and exposure of your end-to-end -end value chain. Whether that's buying fabric from the Far East or serving customers in your retail outlet or providing maintenance for a software package you sell, you must take it step by step across the entire value chain. Brainstorm scenarios around your suppliers, delivering either raw materials, ingredients, packaging materials, or some form of service. Think about your production facilities or the suppliers that, produce, that gives you your finished goods. Think about transportation. How are you moving people around? How are you moving products around? Where are you storing these products? And then, of course, your interaction with customers and consumers, whether that's through an e-commerce platform or in a retail outlet that's, that's uh, brick and mortar. Once you've gone through this whole thing, you can really understand the potential impact and prepare your responses. And you must think about things like supplier failure, border closures like we've mentioned, um, reduction in air freight capacity, or people just having to stay home. The, the, the kind of scenarios that we now have to think about is very different to what we've done in the past. And once you understand well the shape of your value chain and what might happen, 
you can then um, uh, you know, really understand uh, what you need to do to create visibility and early warning systems to tell you when some of these things might fail and come down the line. We, I think we all wish we had an early warning system on the COVID-19, and in some ways we did. Um, some com countries heard about the virus w months before it actually hit them, although we didn't fully appreciate the impact it would have on our local economies. I don't think any of us will be making the same mistakes again based on this. And what it really tells us is that we need to um, you know, be alert to these early warning systems and understand what we're going to do when they hit. Look out for abnormal demand patterns. Work very closely with your suppliers to understand what can they tell you to give you a certain early warning. If something is picked up, you can then respond with well thought through plans and reactions. <clears throat> this three, you know, these three steps really help you to frame your end-to-end -end value chain and forces you to get into details of how it all works and what could potentially go wrong, whether it's a supplier overseas or locally, or whether it's um, you know, how your customers are going to interact with you. You'll really be surprised at how much you discover once you really get into the details. And the additional benefit that we've seen is that you might quite likely, through this exercise, spot opportunities to improve your supply chain performance whether that's cost, revenue, cash, or service levels. I think the days where we run a fully lean supply chain without having a very robust resiliency plan is over. That doesn't mean we have to push a lot of money into excess inventories or, or redundancies that's going to cost us a lot of money, but we do need to understand the impact if something goes wrong. So just to make it practical, I'll give you a couple of thoughts from my side based on clients I work with daily. One of my clients manufactures food that, and they couldn't get one of the critical ingredients um, that came from the Far East simply because borders were closed and flights were grounded. They had to rapidly develop an alternative ingredient option, complete taste test, and they were able to get that product back on shelf within a couple of weeks. Now, had they, before this um, whole crisis um, hit us, understood potential alternatives for their ingredients, they could have put those plans into action in a much quicker fashion. That's just one of the kind of key things I've seen now that I would go ahead advising clients is always have substitutes for the types of products that you use um, and sell to your customers. One of my other clients experienced a big drop in sales through their traditional retail outlets. They then approached the leading e-commerce uh, platform locally and partnered with them, and within a week or two, they were selling through a brand new channel. We've even seen new businesses pop up now that sells groceries and foodstuffs that we couldn't find um, on our shelves, fully packaged meals, and that's really taken off in South Africa to a great extent. And South Africa really is far behind the curve on e-commerce um, when compared to some of the uh, more developed nations. So look at what other business opportunities there might be, because there certainly has been here in South Africa. Another of my clients had to um, really go back and look at how they can support transportation of employees to their place of work to ensure that they're as safe as possible. And that then brought to, um, uh, by a partnership with some transportation companies to make that as efficient as possible. Even our local restaurants faces big challenges with cash flows when they started closing. And what they started doing that I thought was really innovative is to start selling discounted vouchers uh, to go uh, for, for meals when they started to reopen. So it's just these couple of examples that I, I, I've seen that has really driven innovation and digitization within multiple different industries. And when I now ask companies, you know, what's causing or has caused your digital transformation, they do credit COVID with that. If you just look around you, the amount of digitization and innovation that has occurred is absolutely amazing. And I do believe that the world will never be the same again. So spend time thinking about how your supply chain needs to be different to cater for the future. So just to kind of wrap it all up, this three-step process consists, of, you know, really exists across multiple time dimensions. Kyle did introduce the now, next, and beyond framework earlier, and I can really advise that when looking at your future business model, approach, channels, offers, and resiliency plans, consider these time dimensions. What you need to do today is going to be very likely different to the things that you need to do six months from now or even 12 to 18 months from now. Get ahead of the curve. So in summary, if you take one thing away from today regarding supply chain resiliency, please take away that complacency is no longer an option when it comes to robust supply chain resilience. 
It doesn't matter if you're a tiny corner shop, a company that's providing IT services, or a large multinational across um, continents. Be proactive, be creative, and learn from this crisis, and you will be better prepared for when things go wrong in the future. Thanks, Kyle. I'll hand back over to you. Thanks, Anton. We're now going to move on from supply chain and global trade to cover two of the most important areas of the enterprise resilience framework, employee health and well-being and talent and workforce. Determining how to navigate your people through crisis is perhaps the most topical area of discussion right now. And so I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Ranish Nair, to share his practical insights on this topic. Thanks, Kyle. And hello, everyone. Uh, this is Rene Schneier from Chicago. Um, a lot of my work is with boards and CXOs around their people agenda. Uh, and before here in the U.S., I've worked across uh, Europe, Middle East, and, and India as well. So I have a sort of global perspective on how organizations are looking at the people agenda. I'm, I'm delighted to be here with all of you today. So as we all know, people are really at the center of what the world is facing today, right? impacting not just our businesses and our livelihoods, but also our personal lives and the very structure and fabric of how we behave and interact as a community. And what has been really fascinating to see and observe, and I've I personally experienced this with our firm in EY as well as with a number of clients that I serve, is the resilience and drive with which you know, people have responded in the initial stages to the pandemic. You know, many examples of gracious acts and caring for each other, very, very heartwarming. Uh, and, and, you know, a, a quote that has just struck with me from one of the leading public health experts, um, and I quote, you know, everyone wants to know when this will end. Maybe that's not the right question. The right question is, how do we continue? Uh, and in that journey and that discovery of how we want to continue, how we are likely to continue from a people dimension, I want to focus on you know, two very important aspects of of helping our people navigate the current pandemic. You know, the first being around well-being, uh, and secondly around the more broader talent and workforce agenda. Uh, the topic of employee well-being, it's been a hot topic of late, even before the pandemic, and, and just that the current situation that we're in just brought this topic you know, front and center of business leaders and entrepreneurs, and you know, just hear so much time in, in senior leadership sessions spend around that topic. And it's only fair to say most organizations were not prepared for this from an employee well-being perspective. I want to start off sort of very tactically with some of the positives that have come out of the pandemic from an employee building perspective. And I think it's so very important to focus on the positive. There's enough negative information out there, right? So you look at, you know, more time to be at home, more time with family, better eating habits, you know, better quality of sleep, more connectivity, all the virtual, the dear and near ones. You know, we may not be able to quantify these, but at the heart of well-being programs that companies have tried to roll out over the past very many years, these are the outcomes that they were looking to drive towards, right? And the fact that we've had a crisis that helped drive some of these positive outcomes, I think that's a very, very important message that we need to be able to convey and relay to, to our people and the broader communities that we, that we operate in. On that note, um, if just the experience over the last six, eight weeks, uh, if I were to pick one word to define actions that organizations need to take around employee well-being in a pandemic, that is safety. You know, personal employee safety is, is, is paramount. Everything else can wait, right? And if you look at how organizations around the world reacted in the first few weeks of the outbreak, it was really about trying to answer, you know, where are my people? Are they safe? You know, how do we get them to the safety of their homes or, you know, wherever they need to, to get to? Uh, and if that meant work had to pause, so be it, right? Uh, and once companies figured that piece out, the focus then shifted to, okay, how do we work from home? What does remote working look like? And so on and so forth. So if I sort of reflect on what organizations have done and the ones that have sort of better reacted to, uh, to the crisis situation, there are three or four things uh, that we've seen effective organizations do well. The first is 
information is key and just making sure your employees have access to, to credible real-time information uh, and you know being able to advise employees on you know who, who your sort of local health center providers are in, in, the, in the event of an exposure or something so, so you being the sort of single source of truth for that information and that reliable information coming from the organization i think it's paramount spoke about employee health i mean in the event that you know there is a spread in in, in, in your employee base or, or even it might be uh, your employees caring for a sick household member just just having that, that organizational support system uh, helps them drive that broader brand connectivity uh, across. The third thing we've seen organizations do is have very clear policies around, you know, the, the immediate needs that people have around, you know, what, what travel protocols to put in place, you know, what does non-essential business travel mean, what, you know, what the self-quarantine protocols for for employees who are exposed to me, uh, meetings and conferences. So just, just it, it's almost like an employee manual that you would have for for, for most of your functional areas. Being, being tight around some of those policies is what we've seen a lot of these organisations come up. Uh, and lastly, around you know the workforce and facilities. You know, are you are you doing enough to be sort of complying with local regulations uh, and ensuring that you're containing the spread as 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 the case may be. And where we've seen this really come to life is those organizations have set up almost near war room-like settings in the organization where you have a common command center in place. There's a very, very you know, coherent communication strategy, direct communication to employees, whether it's through your newsletters, your virtual meetings, virtual town halls, the internet, you know, whatever the case may be. You have a, a dedicated task force that's communicating and, and serving as that single source of growth. And, and, and that's when we've seen greater connectivity between employees and the organizations and how employees have reacted to it. The other aspect that I'm sure is top of mind for all of you as, as leaders and entrepreneurs is, is the broader context around managing your workforce through, through these uncertain times. And there's four or five things that just stick out for us but business as usual is over, at least for the foreseeable future. Safety for all, above all, right? Uh, and when sort of you to think through returning to the workplace, it, it's about returning in ways at once, clearly not feasible. So how do you sort of begin to prep for an eventual return to work? It should, should, should be top of mind for your HR teams and yourself. And then being able to continually assess it and being nimble in the way you want to sort of look at, you know, day one iterations and, and look at what that transformation under current is like. So I think a lot to think and plan around this. Uh, uh, you know, something that struck me was a recent study that was conducted here in the U.S., and I, I suspect the results may not be very different across the globe, is that employee productivity actually increased during the months of March and April, where a lot of, you know, in, in the U.S., we, we were at our peak. Now, how did this happen? I mean, it's easy to explain, right? You know, there's less travel time, you know, drive time to go meet your customers. But the real question is, is that sustainable? You know, why did we see an increase in productivity? It's probably because people had more time. They probably did it because they were rising to the occasion. Uh, Maybe they did it because of fear of loss of job. So I think a combination of those factors. But, but the real question is, how do we translate this into sustainable productivity? And I think that that is the question HR leaders are asking. I mean, if this is a long-drawn exercise, how do we make sure this, this productivity spike that we've seen is sustainable? And that's where a lot of the conversations that we are having with organizations is around segmentation of the workforce to see how do you return back to the workplace. I mean, a lot of organizations here, especially on the technology side, are really looking at a permanent work-from-home model. Uh, so we, we, we expect to see more of a hybrid model coming through where organizations may move to more of a permanent work-from-home, given some of the benefits that it accrues, given real estate cost savings that are there. 
but also being able to see for those who have to return to work manufacturing sector, for example, how do you find that balance between you know, permanent work from home versus being able to sort of return to work? Another recent study that Gallup did here is that 54% of the workforce said they would continue to want to permanently work from home. And that doesn't include the full gamut of the of the knowledge sector itself. So, uh, so being able to sort of think through what that future operating model would look like, I think is, 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 is super critical. So what that means from a talent perspective is when you look at you know, new locations of talent supply chain, for example, what's the impact to your business, to your clients, to your tax immigration requirements, um, are you still going to continue your your recruitment plan as is? How do you communicate some of that uh, in your workforce of the workplace of the future? That might look a, a, a lot different as well. So I think a combination of those factors would, would help help determine how that future operating model from a talent lens uh, would, would, would look like. So there isn't sort of one straight jacketed answer, but I think what organizations are really trying to think about at this stage is if we are to go to more of these hybrid models, are the skill sets that we have today in the organization the right skill sets we need for the future? Can we automate some of this? So even rethinking the capabilities that are there and, and looking at sort of new pockets of talent, new skill sets will be absolutely critical as you sort of think through this. There are sort of more detailed slides capturing some, some very sort of tactical action items around these which you can uh, there in the deck which you can which you can download as well. Uh, I, I just want to sort of leave, leave off with, you know one, one overarching comment which is, our ability as leaders to to lead through empathy. So this is this is about people and not just about the work environment, but there are things that like, we need to take care of in the personal space as well, right? So being able to lead with with empathy is what would sort of eventually drive that, you know, in answers to some of those questions around productivity, brand, and making sure your your people um, stick uh, around. So. I'll leave it at that, and uh, Kyle, hand it back over to you. Thanks, Ranish. We'll now move to our first uh, Q&A session. So please do remember to type your questions into the Q&A box, and we'll try to address as many as possible. Also, just keep in mind, you can add in the questions as we go through the presentation. So in the second, the second set, if you have questions, please just add them in, and we, we will address them once we get to the Q&A session. First for you, and Anton, what are your tips on best practices for small businesses when negotiating uh, with suppliers? Hi, Carl. Thanks. Uh, great question. Um, this, of course, topic of negotiation is is, is a well studied topic, and you know actually does warrant a, a session on its own, given all the information and, uh, and everything that's available. You know, for me to distill it down, uh, the key to any negotiation and something we apply at EY as well is this whole concept of a, of a principled negotiation. And, and what I mean by that is the, the whole you know, kind of concept of, of driving towards a win-win outcome. And whether you're a small business or a medium or large business or negotiating with a supplier or a service contract or for stationary, um, there's always some form of win-win that's required um, that does suit all parties involved, even if it does, you know, lead to some form of acceptable compromise. You know, to keep it short, um, I would say, you know, prepare thoroughly. Too often we see negotiations that people arrive unprepared. Understand your positions, understand your must-haves and your trade-offs and understand what is optional for you in the negotiation. And it doesn't really matter what negotiation it is. You have to know what your walk away position is. And something that I learned is that a negotiation is always about trading. There's always a give and a take. And if we stick to statements like if then, I think most negotiations will uh, be quite productive and lead to a win-win outcome.
Thanks, Anton. Um, moving to moving to a question for for, for Ranish. Um, what are your day to day top tips for employees that having to, that are having to work from home? How would you how would you address uh, managers and and entrepreneurs with their employees and how to address how they can work best from home? Yeah, great, great question, Kyle. Thanks. Uh, I'll look at it in sort of four, four broad buckets. Uh, one is around connectivity and personalizing messages, uh, being able to listen, being able to support, and lead by example. So just some very practical tips around how, how we do it at, at, at EVI and we're seeing organizations do it as well. So yeah, we may not be meeting in person, but we do what we call virtual coffee sessions, for example, or virtual or, or open door sessions where you know a, a leader would just put 30 minutes on the calendar, no set agenda, people can come online and, and have a conversation. And, and where possible, we encourage people to be on on video, so you know, as much as you can recreate that environment, it makes a huge difference. So, so it's a great platform for for a leader to sort of be available to people. It's almost like an open door policy, and and have that conversation. We we also do as a, as part of our team team meetings, you know, 15 minutes every day. Again, let's talk, but maybe not talk about work, for example. So so li little things which kind of make a big difference in being able to sort of drive that productivity aspect. F feedback is huge. Uh, so just being able to sort of communicate and manage that feedback is, is, is very, very critical. The one dimension that's often lost out uh, in this, uh, and where there's a lot of focus around people, is you, know, you as organizations being able to provide that support infrastructure from a technology perspective as well. So whether you're on and the Microsoft Teams and Zoom or whatever. So have, having that infrastructure support ready for people to be able to use that is, is, is super critical. So open communication, having your virtual coffee sessions. And another trick that I would be, you know, we've, we've, we've seen sort of work very well is in, if you have a 16-minute meeting or a 30-minute meeting, we'll stop at 25 minutes, we'll stop at 55 minutes. It just gives you that five minutes for people to just just to stretch their sense themselves or um, just to take a walk, it makes a difference. It helps contribute to that extra sort of productivity dimension as well. So, so as much as we can recreate those, those, those in-person settings virtually, leveraging technology does, does, does seem to work. Uh, thanks, R Ranish. Moving back to, to a question for Anton. What do you think will be the primary fact, uh, factors influencing international supply chains po in the post-COVID world? Thanks, Kyle. Um, another good question, and, and really only time will tell. I think we have to, in some way, push through this um, and, and really be very agile as we adapt our businesses. However, we've already started seeing changes across the value chains. One thing that we've certainly seen is this concept of near or onshoring is very much back on the table. And this is to increase supplier security into your businesses. We've seen that extensive resiliency and increased redundancy will be introduced. And we're also seeing trade lanes and mode of transportation being reevaluated. Re you know, things like shifts between air and ocean transport is happening much quicker than in the past. And I would say one thing that I think um, any business should be very cognizant of is the change in the way that consumers will likely behave. You know, one thing that's been, you know, very, very visible in terms of this whole thing is the uptake of e-commerce is, is, of course, um, you know, very prevalent. But then what we're also seeing from an EY perspective, having done a whole host of um, uh, surveys uh, and tests in the market, is that we are quite likely going to see a change of how consumers buy, what they buy, and when they buy it. We'll be seeing consumers that are really going to bed down, save money, and be very frugal. And some consumers we will see that, you know, came into COVID being very frugal, might become, you know, much more... Um, uh, free to spend their money coming out of this. So, so focus on understanding the, con the consumer and how they will change 
and make sure that you adapt your business to um, kind of um, really leverage that change in the consumer and, and, and stay close to that change. That's some, of, that's some thoughts from me, uh, uh, Kyle. Thanks, Anton. Moving on to one last question for, for Anish. How do you think skill sets uh, for people will change and differ now that we have gone through parts of the COVID-19 crisis? Great, great question there. So let me give you a, a real-life example of, of work that we're doing with one of the organizations, heavy on the sales side. So a big shift from a selling perspective is how do you look at virtual selling? The concept of virtual selling is very, very different to you know, sort of an in-person selling where you sort of focus more on body language and tone and a lot of other sort of selling things that we can pick up when you're in person. Uh, and it's quite possible someone who's a very good salesperson in the pre-COVID world might struggle to to sell in a virtual environment. So how do you you know, you know, reskill sales teams to be able to do virtual selling, for example. So that's a great example of how sort of sales teams are sort of beginning to think through some of this. Another example, you know, services organizations, for example, I mean, you, you run workshops or in, in-person meetings. How do you run a virtual session with, with 100 people online and, and collaborate? So there's an element of being able to understand some of that technology, but also be able to sort of manage meetings online, for example. So a lot of that aspect around virtual selling, virtual collaboration and interaction with clients, that's changing. The, the other sort of bigger shift, more sort of technology shift that we're seeing is, uh, the, you know, the, the whole discussion around automation and, and, and RPAs, which, which were already in the works, that will get accelerated as well. So a lot of the transactional skill sets, whether it's in the sort of pure accounting space or, or the HR transactional space, uh, I think the momentum to drive automation around that would, would increase, uh, which would then make organizations think through, you know, do we really need those transactional skill sets to, uh, and are we able to trade off being or to be able to automate them versus keep some of those skill sets in-house as well. Thanks, Ranish, for, for that answer. Now we will move to the, the second half of our session and hand over to my colleague, Daniela, who will speak with us about how to maintain effective communication with your customers through crisis. Thank you so much, Kyle, and thank you everybody for the opportunity to talk here to so many people. Um, I'm originally from Brazil. I studied at, grew up there, and had my most of my career actually outside of Brazil, so working in the UK, and then now moved to been four years in the UAE, in the Middle East, which is a completely new environment for me. And that gave me the opportunity to work in different countries with different people and observe different behaviors of consumer. And I wanted to talk a little bit outside of the theme of man maintaining effective communication with your customer, because I don't believe there is a one-size-fits-all approach. And instead, it all depends on how you define your business model, as well as how flexible, adaptable, and innovative you set yourself and your business to be. So the consumers don't change the behavior because it's cool, because they, they feel like it. We don't change our behavior unless there's a need for it. And when I mention need, it can be a belief, can be religious need, can be money, economic, can be health, like we're facing with COVID, or it can be a problem that you're trying to solve. So COVID gave us a, a quite interesting opportunity as it accelerated the move to digital creating a need which is quite unique or rare that to come across with from both the demand and the offering side. So suddenly we were all hit overnight and we had to change. A number of people in businesses, they, they realized there was a gap either because the business had no digital footprint, no digital presence. So suddenly your face-to-face -face business was no longer there. And on the other hand, quite a number of consumers, they're not confident online shoppers, for example, 
and they couldn't go to the market or they had limited time to go to the market to do their grocery shopping. So it came both sides on demand and offering, and it was quite abrupt to say, we have to change, we have to do something now. And I think we all witnessed that. And it's interesting to say as well, time, time is everything, but not necessarily being the first, but for you to create a mark, it has to be the right time with the right proposition. And we all talk about brand and knowing the brands out there and, and we all believe that it's easy, but I don't think the brand plays a, a role to it. It's, it's, it. It helps, but it's not key. You can actually define a brand if you are at the right place at the right time with the right proposition. You can make your brand. So interesting enough, we were all carrying on with our businesses when the COVID hit. And as I mentioned, so overnight, all our business models had to change. Our habits had to change. Our ways of working and interacting with each other had to change. And we were faced, it seems quite abrupt, but we were faced with two choices. Either we would adapt or we would succumb. And we would succumb to the virus, we would succumb to debt, and even to loneliness. How many people here that were talking about being lonely and didn't have anyone to talk to? Even some businesses, they didn't know how to work remotely. And I saw some large businesses uh, just say they had enough reserve to survive a few months or more. Some of them, they had the brand to rely on and other ones, they had power to renegotiate their debt. So they're all gonna be able to stay afloat for a while. But on the other hand, some small businesses and startups, they didn't have those large reserves. They probably rely on some loyal customers they didn't have vast footprints. And they all face the question, what do we do now? You innovate. This is what I think. You innovate. You take risks. You change. I believe that some or many did try. And I'm sure we all have a lot of personal examples, but I just wanted to flag some. And I wanted to reflect why they were successful and what makes a difference. And these are personal things I observed in my personal life, but also in some of my clients. Gyms. So gyms is a very much face-to-face -face, uh, activity. And suddenly no one could go. Everything was on hold. Memberships got extended. Big staff was let go. And the gyms would say, it's fine, I have the membership. In a couple of weeks or three weeks' time, I can you know, resume my business. But for the personal trainers, what do they do? They're going to say two, three, four weeks, or who knows how long for, without an inflow of money. And they simply started to offer classes on Instagram, free classes, live sessions. And the objective was to get their name out there. People, all of us who were at home, we couldn't go to our gyms. What do we do? We pretty much go and we went online. And a friend of mine, you know, told me, oh, there's this Instagram guy that is giving free lessons, live lessons. And it was a word of mouth. Also, WhatsApp was a good communication um, tool used. So then we went online and we started seeing this new personal trainer that was giving free lessons online. And we saw different classes from other people and we all liked it. Six weeks later, some of the gyms decided to give online classes. What happened? Do they have clients? Not a lot, actually quite few, if any. And why is that? Because there's no need to change. We were all happy with this guy that we didn't know giving us personal trainers. And some of us actually contacted them for private lessons. And that's how they got their business going. So I, as you all know, I live here in Dubai and Dubai has some big brands. And I mean, it's interesting that it covers brands from Europe and, and the US all in the same place. Um, when COVID came, we all started going to the local businesses to help them, but also because they were very quick in supporting us. And that made a difference. You would call them, it would bring whatever you need. They created an app 
Within two weeks of the lockdown, they created, they came together and created a local app of conveniences, you know, markets, pharmacies, restaurants, all of them doing delivery. You could talk to them, you can put on the app, you can go on WhatsApp, and they would give you whatever you needed. This is how you respond to your client needs. Then, but not only small businesses can adapt quickly. So the other day I was watching a series, and I'm just slagging you this example so you can think about what works and what doesn't. So I was watching a series called Blacklist, and COVID made them stop recording their last season finale. What do you do? They innovated, and it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They put a mix of regular filming with animated characters to close and finish the episode. So I took a lot of the time now, and I just wanted to close just saying a couple of things. Do listen to your clients. Listen to them. See what they want. Understand their needs. Observe your clients. You can learn a lot by just observing them and their behavior, either on the field of digital and data. And most important of all, be flexible and agile on your business model. Reimagine your customer journey and be innovative. Just remember that communication is not a one-way thing. In fact, communication is not what you say, but it's what the other party actually understands. Thank you very much. I hand over to Kyle. Thank you, Daniela. We're now gonna move on from our customer and brand to our last topic of this session, how to manage your cash flow and finances. And I'm pleased to introduce my colleague, Andrew Hill, to share his practical insights on the topic. Thanks, Kyle. Um, you know, as, as Jesse mentioned at the top of the webcast, you know, I've had um, kind of a varied experience in the sort of value creation and profit improvement space. And so I actually started out my career uh, in restructuring, which is very much focused on your cash position, you know, making sure that you can stop the bleeding if you're in free fall and ultimately climb your way out of you know, bankruptcy. But for the past several years, I've also been working in less distressed situations. So just working on sort of your steady state profitability whenever you're in a situation where your performance might be slipping and what are some of the typical levers that you can pull and then have also worked on the growth side and you know, developing launch plans and, and your kind of revenue clarity for impact entrepreneurs, like many of you. Um, a lot of US-centric experience, but also some international, some international perspective there as well. And something that's interesting is that many of the lessons from larger companies, which you know, a lot of what you know, a, a firm like ours is going to be focusing on is, is really large companies. They can actually be easily applied to earlier stage venture companies. And uh, a lot of the things that I'm going to share may come across as um, just good hygiene. And I think that, that that is the case. And so, you know, they might be things that you know about, levers that you know to pull and explore, but I think that it's good to remind ourselves, you know, what we can really come down to when looking at our cash position at the end of the day. And a lot of the perspectives that have been shared across supply chain, you know, customer, brand, talent, workforce, they're all going to have an impact on your cash and financial decisions or can. So, you know, when we look at the cost and capital levers that you're considering, um, a lot of them are taken in parallel, and they'll be based on the strength of your financial position, especially going into this crisis period. And they'll also be impacted by the expected economic recovery in your local area. So in addition to cash, you know, what can you do to strengthen your financial position? You're also going to be looking at your capacity. You know, how do I quickly shift to meet evolving levels of demand? the continuity of your business, you know, how you should look to right-size your business for the longer term, um, what kind of flexibility do you have in place as you operate coming into recovery? So how do you streamline, simplify, build some resiliency? And then, you know, I think even Kyle mentioned at the, at the onset that many of our clients are in relatively stable cash positions where they're 
they're actually taking advantage of the situation to look at innovation, growth, new opportunities, changing the way that they do business um, because they have the flexibility to do so. And so, you know, primarily you know, what I'm focusing on in, in kind of my portion is talking about strengthening your financial position and specifically your cash position. And so, you know, one of the things that that is um, key that we've seen implemented across our clients is something that actually Renesh shared earlier, is to form a crisis management team that kind of leads a multidisciplinary approach. And you can also form the communication strategies and plans to this team, and they should be working with leadership to uh, monitor liquidity and ongoing cash flow performance and forecasting. So, you know, this team can also lead your regular engagement with employees, investors, your key stakeholders, um, especially when it comes to working proactively with your creditors or uh, ratings agencies, as the case may be. You know, smaller organizations actually tend to have a communication advantage over some larger companies, and you can use multiple channels available. I know Daniela referenced social media and, and some innovative ways to get out and communicate, particularly with customers. So. Um, you know, I think first, one of the things that we recommend that you do, like I was talking about, is take take the context of where your industry was heading before COVID and think about what the impact might be coming out of this. So that includes the impact to customers, their needs, and their behaviors. But if there was a particular trajectory that the space and you operated was heading before crisis, there will still be some of those elements and some of those dynamics that we expect to continue. And then some things may stop and then they may change. So, um, you know, everything that you should be, that you should be uh, looking at will inform ultimately the decisions that you make with regard to cash. So one of the first things that's going to be top of mind for people is tapping into stimulus programs or tax breaks. And, you know, obviously there are a lot of different countries and localities represented on today's webcast, but I think that the ultimate thing here is to make sure that you're exploring federal, you know, state and city or, you know, province, county or local programs, making sure that you're looking at every level and also not necessarily self-selecting out of going after certain aid. Um, depending on eligibility requirements, you know, depending on the space in which you operate and what your ultimate mission or impact is, you might be able to get creative with some of how you go after that. And then you're also going to be obviously looking to um, get access to and secure lines of credit. And I don't think that, you know, debt should be something that should scare you off. But one of the things that we recommend is in addition to looking at a typical measure of your ability to cover your debt service, which is just one of your like like your quick ratio or your kind of current ratio of how you know can I cover what I'm going to be expected to pay in my debt service over the next year, you should also consider tracking a measure like your maximum annual debt service. And so that takes a look at over the lifetime of my long and short term debt, you know, what is the maximum amount that I would ever be required to pay, even if that's future, in the future, a higher amount than it is this year, and then still making sure that you have enough cash or, or um, you know, in a lot of cases, even the earnings to cover that. And then I think that something that can often be, you know, overlooked when we're looking at cutting costs and improving our financial position is focusing on working capital. So labor tends to get a lot of attention. It's the largest cost pool in a lot of companies, and it's something that is kind of an easy lever that people go to and they want to start laying people off, um, you know, if you, have, if you have a large workforce. But a lot of times you can avoid some of the worst cuts just by looking at working capital first. Uh, sometimes this working capital improvement can make the difference in your survival or your bankruptcy, um, especially if you're in a lower margin business. And so when you're looking at working capital, you want to see your how often you're turning over your inventory, and you want to measure this, and you want to make sure that you are 
tracking against others and that operate in your same space. If you do have inventory that you're selling at us, um, you want to look at your sales outstanding days and then your days payable outstanding. And all these taken together kind of make up your cash conversion cycle. And so, again, this is a typical kind of hygiene measure, but you would be surprised at how often these sort of typical or um, kind of basic blocking and tackling measures can go overlooked. And so when you're looking at sales outstanding, um, that may be a little bit more difficult to negotiate at present because you're probably going to have the people to whom you are a creditor uh, with your, you know, kind of accounts receivable wanting to negotiate their terms with you, um, whether that's another business or whether it's a consumer even extending credit terms, you might actually see a measure like your day sales outstanding increase. But likewise, you can turn around and look at your payables and you can increase your day's payable outstanding just by um, not paying as quickly all of your suppliers and your vendors. This takes a lot of communication, of course, and you know, there are many different considerations on the supply chain side that I know we already went over. But even small improvements can sometimes yield um, just greater flexibility with the cash that you have to continue your operation. So um, in the event that you're able, you know, we also can recommend, you know, taking a look at restructuring debt because of the kind of unprecedented nature of what we're all facing, it's opened up a lot of different avenues to have these types of negotiations around um, your debt terms and your debt payments as well. So something that is easy to do, again, just to free up cash is to uh, just to have temporary pause on the discretionary spending and large capital initiatives. And, um, you know, finally, if you can't really avoid other mechanisms, you know, we're going to be looking at things like reducing personnel cost. Um, so when you're looking at your operations, I think we've already covered a lot of other sources of freeing up cash, looking at third-party spend, looking at your supply chain, looking at the flexibility of your workforce, you're probably going to be looking at the need to have essentially two modes of operation uh, when you when you think about potential you know reinfection or just potential need to be able to flex in times of crisis, and so. You know, building in flexible labor models also might mean looking at accelerating digital initiatives, accelerating things like automation. And then finally, you know, you're probably going to be at some point needing to report this out to investors. And I think that, you know, we tend to focus on, on kind of cash position measures. But I think what you'll see is that there will be more kind of for the U.S., you know, like non-GAAP measures or non-standard measures that try to give investors a, uh, a picture of your underlying ability to either generate cash, conserve cash, or just give a better picture into your underlying business instead of, um, you know, a one-time event. But just make sure that when you're doing that, you're not um, sort of piling on your one-time event costs so that you're trying to make yourself look better post-crisis, because I think investors are starting to get wary um, to those kind of measures. So, you know, happy to pause there and turn it back to Kyle, and I think we're going to go into some questions. Thanks, Andrew. Um, now I'll move to our, our second round of Q&A questions, and thanks for everyone who has been engaging in, in the Q&A dialogue back and forth with our, with our speakers keep sending them through and we'll try to get to them if we can. I, I want to open up to Daniela first to speak or, or ask her a question around, how can businesses make sure that they don't come across as tone deaf during this, during this crisis? Thanks, Kyle, and I think it's a very good question. That, that's a difficult theme because you will come as tone deaf to some clients. Like you can't please everybody, and that's a fact. And the way, in general, you shouldn't come across, and not necessarily at the time of crisis, but in general as a tone day, is if you're asking a question to your client or if you open a channel for the client to talk to you, then be prepared to listen, to change, and to respond accordingly. Otherwise, you'll be seen as tone deaf, right? And 
if you don't have that channel, then I believe you're wrong in the first place because your clients are the ones that tell you what problems they have. They're not telling you the solution. They're telling you the problem they have. And for you to be able to listen to them is by solving their problems. And that's when you're going to come across this. Yes, I listen to you. Here is what I can see. And this is how I respond. And this is how I'm trying to solve your problem. Back to you. Thanks, Danielle. A question to, to Andrew. What would be some key recommendations that you have for managing relationships with investors and other financial uh, sources? How do you best just manage that relationship? Yeah, I think that, you know, especially if you have, um, you know, you're venture funded, you know, maybe you are in that kind of blueprint stage like we talked about at the beginning and you don't necessarily have, um, you know, you're not generating kind of revenue on your own, then I think that it's, it's important to uh, get in front of the communication and have um, through a mechanism like your, your kind of crisis management team have like a single point of contact or a consistent point of contact that's a face to your investors and your investor stakeholder community. Um, so that's one thing that, that we would recommend. And then in addition to that, I think that it's okay if you are upfront about kind of the basis of your forecasting. But like I was mentioning, when it comes to certain reporting considerations, when you're talking to uh, you know, any of your stakeholders, I think that you should be clear about what you're using as your assumptive basis. And then also, as there are changes, just making sure to keep everybody abreast of those and making it clear that you're not um, trying to overstate the impact of COVID-19, because that's something that we're just seeing investors becoming more wary of, that different companies are trying to, again, kind of pile on the, the one-time expenses and the impact so that, um, you know, maybe they can, maybe they can uh, claim something that's actually going to be a future hit this year and, and look better by comparison when they're coming out into recovery. So. Uh, th thanks, Andrew. Uh, moving back to a question for, for Daniela. What do you think will be some of the primary factors influencing consumer trends now and through a post-COVID-19 world? Uh, thanks, Kyle. To me, the primary factor will be the digital side. And it did change behavior because of the needs. Remember, I mentioned right on, on my talk, we had to change our behavior. We had to change the way we interact with businesses, with other people, and so on. And I believe the new norm will be, will be different. And people will be used to having this digital world much more in their lives than they were before. Not that we were not digital at all, and in fact, we were all pretty much on social media and so on, but it's how we use it differently. And I think that for me is the primary factor. We all used to say, uh, we Google all the time, we talk on social media, we read news and so on, but how can we now work effectively? Now, how can we be consumers? How can we be the retailers and use this tool effectively and be able to communicate with our clients effectively? And from our side as customers, how can we listen to this more effectively as well? For me, is, is that just to acceleration for everybody? It's a, it's a whole new way. And potentially, uh, going forward as well, not only people saying that businesses will end up working remotely more, but I think people will, stand, will end up buying remotely more than they are. You get, you're going to see a great increase on that from people that have, haven't done this before. Great, Daniela. Just a, a follow-up question. A as you mentioned, uh, businesses will be going more through digital ways to be able to communicate with, with customers, um, and that's only accelerating with the, t uh, with the COVID-19 crisis. Is there a way that businesses and entrepreneurs can help to differentiate themselves um, in a digital world where there's everyone is inundated with different marketing uh, messages coming at them? 
Thanks, Carl. Yes, I believe there is. Uh, see, people need to use and one example, right? It's not necessarily true for everything, but they should use data analytics as one of the key things to be able to communicate effectively. And when I say data analytics, is, as you mentioned, we're all inundated with emails. We're all inundated with uh, you know, WhatsApp and pop-ups and alerts and so on. How do you differentiate yourself? How can you cut through this noise? You need to be relevant. And when I mentioned the right time, it has to be the right time. So if I'm looking, for example, to, to buy a car, it's not about saying, saying sorry to me, I need an advertisement or sending an email, oh, listen, you have several cars in here. But perhaps it's an advertisement saying, listen, we can help you get rid of your people's car. Do you need help on this? But you need some data. You need to know your clients. You need to be able to be there at the right time. And again, I imagine that we've all received tons and tons of emails, and I don't believe emails is the most effective way of communicating anymore. I ignore half of them. Everybody that I know ignores half of them. My clients are stopping sending emails. But it's about having a two or three way communication. So for example, you can send an email, but at the same time, you can drop a WhatsApp and say, listen, I just dropped you an email because I think there's something relevant for you. I'm here for you if you have any questions. And those chat box, those WhatsApp conversations, business accounts, and so on, that shows you there for the client to answer the questions whenever they are ready and whenever they need to, also helps you to understand what they need and when. And with that information, you can make yourself relevant. And again, through different channels, not necessarily rely on one that is absolutely known and old, which is email, or just one, so for example, advertisement on, on pages when you go on Google. That helps, but it's not the only thing. We have to be able to work effectively with different channels. Oh, thanks, Daniela. What, one last question for, for Andrew, and this comes directly from the audience. Should, the focus, should your focus with cash management be on conserving cash or finding ways to better managing it? Yeah, so this is this is a really great question because it gets back to the trade-off that I brought up when it comes to making cuts versus focusing on working capital. And so, you know, when you're faced with the prospect of needing to actually, you know, conserve cash and not spend it or cut down spending, these decisions can be difficult. Sometimes they can be political, depending on the organization you're operating in. Or um, sometimes, again, they mean that you might have to be forced to resort to laying people off or um, impacting you know, lives of people who are ultimately you know, either your employees or your partners who you think are critical to delivering your mission. So while everyone's situation is going to be a little different, I think that focusing on working capital first and looking at how you manage like when your money comes in and goes out can help you actually alleviate some of the knee-jerk reaction pressure that you might feel to just make cuts indiscriminately. It can, it can even buy you a little bit of time while you're evaluating the impact on your supply chain and the impact on your customer environment. So it may not be you know, the ultimate you know, um, the ultimate solve for everything is something that can at least free up resources. So. Thanks, Andrew. One one last question for you: Are there? Do you have any pointers on pointers in how to access and also apply for emergency financing, either from governments or from your the financial sources that you are currently working through, what are the key ways that you would think about best to uh, access the, these capital sources in in the time of crisis? Yeah, so you know, speaking uh, probably extremely broadly, 
Uh, I think that when you're looking at things that are coming down from a government source, either you know national or, or more local, um, you know, a lot of times it's just knowing which agencies are you know set up to help, especially small businesses. So in the U.S., for example, you have the Small Business Administration, and they're going to have certain disaster programs in normal disasters, in air quotes, and also something around like COVID-19 related. Um, you know, special special pools of money. And every different organization will have different goals for their funding. So you might see that things are focused on, say, agriculture or food supply, or you might have some, um, some organizations that are focused on, you know, essential businesses or restaurants or, um, you know, uh, just different businesses that are providing a particular service or operating in a particular sector. So one thing that I know I mentioned was being a bit creative about your own enterprise's eligibility for that. A lot of times people will self-select out from applying for those types of government programs because they feel that they don't meet the eligibility requirements, when in reality they would be able to make a case that they actually do meet them. Now, you can't lie. You can't you know, stretch the truth. But sometimes if you think about the second degree impact that you might be having or how you actually are a link in a value chain for another industry, you can sometimes make the case um, that, that you do qualify. Or we actually were, were working with a client recently um, on, you know, getting some expenses covered via a, a grant that were technically outside of a time eligibility window and it was a fairly arbitrary kind of deadline and so they were able to get an exception for that uh, when it comes to private financing and banking you know, again what what you're going to need to prove is that there's a line of sight into how you're going to be able to pay this back so that's where measures like not only your coverage ratio which you have to be above a one on your coverage ratio a one point x you know um, to, to show that you're not technically going to default if you take on this loan, you also will need to be able to report other measures that show your stability. And if you don't have immediate cash flow now, that you can generate the cash in the future to be able to pay that back. So that's where additional measures of resiliency like maximum annual debt service can come into play. Um, and so it, it's going to be more of a probably just the facts type of conversation that you run into, but I think that nobody wants to see too much tightening of credit markets, at least in those countries, and so I think that you'll see even a lot of private institutions um, that are looking for some flexibility here. Uh, th thanks, Andrew. Before I hand it back to, to Jesse and Floor to close out the webinar, I wanted to hear from the audience again, this time to understand which of the nine areas of the COVID-19 enterprise resilience framework is most affecting your enterprise right now? Supply chain and global trade, employee health and well-being, talent and workforce, customer and brand, financial and investor, risk, government and public policy, technology and information security, or insurance and legal disputes. And we'll give you uh, 15 to 20 seconds to, to fill in your answers. Okay, I, I can see. I can see now that it looks like employee health and well-being is one of the is the most critical thing that's affecting you. And in this time, it, it's very understandable that that is that is one of the critical issues that's affecting your your enterprises. I will now hand back to Jesse to to wrap up for us uh, from the the event.
Thanks, Kyle, and thank you to, to all of our speakers on today's webinar who've shared some hopefully really valuable and, and practical insights for you all today. Um, and really great to see the engagement with the audience uh, around the, the Q&A, and hopefully we've addressed as many of those questions either through the, the Q&A panel or indeed directly uh, through the platform. Um, and as a reminder, you will be able to listen back to this webinar on demand and access these slides um, via the resources list. But before we closed, uh, I just want to share with you some of the follow-on resources and services that you can access in addition to this webinar, again, through the resources list on your screen. As I mentioned at the top of this call, EY extends the, the value of our knowledge and networks to impact entrepreneurs in, in a number of ways to, to help them achieve greater scale and impact. You can access free EY insights and tools in relation to COVID-19, including the easy-to-use self-service digital enterprise resilience tool, which enables businesses to assess their COVID-19 response against those nine areas of enterprise resilience that Kyle shared previously. You can also access a number of the not-for-profit resources and services that we have designed specifically for impact startups and scale-ups. This includes professional services, where we provide full-time hands-on support to businesses globally for typically up to 12 weeks to help them overcome barriers to growth. It also includes skills development and coaching sessions, including webinars like this one. And finally, we also provide digital tools, including EY Velocity and EY Finance Navigator. EY Velocity is a free digital platform that helps ambitious entrepreneurs to accelerate their growth journey using the established EY Seven Drivers of Growth framework. And the EY Finance Navigator is an online financial planning tool which is trusted by entrepreneurs in more than 50 countries and which enables enterprises to build financial plans and make cash flow projections which can be exported simply and easily into Excel. And in light of COVID-19, you can actually access a free three-month license for the EY Finance Navigator if you register for it before the 31st of May. And outside of this, we also always offer a 75% impact discount uh, for impact startups. So if these resources are of interest, then please do check out the links within the resources list on your screen. And I'd just like to thank you all for, for taking the time out of your busy schedules to join us today. And I will now pass over to Flora at Impact Hub to close us out. Yes. Uh, thank you, everyone. So first of all, a massive thank you um, to everybody from EI for, for being here with us today and for um, sharing the model with us and for focusing on the, the different kinds of topics and really honing in there. Um, and it was also great to see um, so many of our audience engaged and posing questions. So um, yeah, it was really great to see that. And um, for everybody who uh, had to drop off a little bit earlier or who feels like um, there's actually a lot of valuable information here that uh, other people could benefit from. Um, as always, we will um, share after the session the recording, and we will also make sure um, the resources list that um, Jesse already talked about, that that's um, available to you in an ongoing basis as well. Uh, and we will also, as always, share our satisfaction survey with you so you can fill it out and tell us how we can even improve our offering for you. Then what you see on the screen right now um, is our next edition. So um, we are going live with our sixth edition on June 16th. Um, for the folks in uh, Europe, it's going to be earlier at 8 a.m. And uh, for the people in the Asian region, this is particularly exciting. Um, because, uh, first of all, it's in the afternoon, 2 p.m., which is wonderful, and uh, the topic is around open social innovation. So we will hear from Audrey Tang, Taiwan's digital minister in charge of social innovation, and she will talk to us about the Taiwan model in tackling COVID-19. So we will address topics like open social innovation, um, open technology, and uh, open civil government, and those are... Yeah, very, very exciting topics. I'm already thrilled and can't wait to hear that. If you're interested, feel free to check out the live registration page um, as of next week. We will update it and you can register. And uh, last but not least, if you have any questions or uh, want to connect with us in any kind of way, you can do that um, through connect at impacthub.net as displayed on the screen. So once again, thank you everybody who attended today and special thank you to 
E Y and everybody from the team. Thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of the day, morning, afternoon, or evening. Goodbye from Impact Hub.